well, it's 2026 and the hits keep coming. We had a nice little break and it's now back to sliding into the singularity. And today, Elon is on a warpath. There's a lot of things going on with Elon XAI, his lawsuit with OpenAI. Also, there's a new partnership with the Department of War. It's now called the Department of War. But we'll come back to all of that. Let's start with this breaking news. So this is, and I apologize if I mispronounce it, Pata Ivanasvili. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. But he's a researcher at UCI, Irvine, California, and he had early internal beta version of Grok 4.20. So this gentleman is a professor of mathematics at UCI, former postdoc at Princeton, exploring what AI can and can't do in math. So he's saying that it, Grok 4.20, it found a new Bellman function for one of the problems that he's been working with his student and Alpe. After which he proceeds to write out a lot of words, some of which you might know. Before we go into this, let me kind of just quickly give you a very simplified version of, of what they're talking about here. So imagine you have cliffs like this, right? So you can kind of run around here, but if you go over the edge, you fall to your doom. I mean, so you can sort of stay anywhere here, but if you go over the edge, you're dead. So th these are the cliffs. This is kind of the edge of the cliff, right? Now imagine we unleash some sort of a wild crazed animal here and it will run around randomly. So you sort of know how fast it moves, but you have no idea where it's going to move, right? So it might run off the cliff or it might run off in the other direction. Your goal is to prove that no matter what random steps it takes, it will never crash. It will never go off the cliff. Now you could assimilate an infinite number of paths, basically every possible random path this thing could take. And so humans usually kind of use intuition. They just kind of guesstimate, they, they estimate. So sort of like, as long as we sort of keep in this range, we should be safe, right? So I'm 99% sure that if we stay in this range, we're going to be safe. It's not going to crash. It's not going to fly off the cliff. So if I understand what he's saying correctly, that's kind of what they did here. So they kind of created this formula with this safe zone where they're, they're pretty sure. But after five minutes of working, Grok420 produced an explicit formula, which they talk about here. But the point is this. He's saying that this gives a sharp lower bound. Sharp lower bound here, what that means is that Grok was basically able to draw a line that's very close to the actual cliff, right? So while human mathematicians, they sort of have this like safety zone just to make sure everything's fine, right? So they kind of draw the line here far away, kind of just to make extra certain because we don't know where it is. So we kind of draw it here where we're pretty sure it's right. Grok drew a sharp bound, meaning very, very close to the actual cliff. And here towards the bottom, he also says, so. Previously, the best known lower bound was this. Then their paper they produced, they obtained this. And this Grok, Grok's Bellman function is actually sharp. So if you didn't like my deranged pig and the cliffs of the Dover example, you can imagine a mountain. And the first researcher slowly climbed up the mountain, got to this point and said, well, we know that this mountain is at least 2,000 feet. Then they slowly climbed up the mountain. They said, well, actually, it's at least 3,000 feet, right? So they slowly climb up it, and they, they're able to say how, based on how far they got was, that, that's at least this high because we got there. So here's what Grok 4.20 did. It magically teleported. It just appeared. It teleported to the top of the mountain and said, no, actually, it's, it's 4,000 feet. So instead of a painstaking process of crawling up the mountain and saying, well, it's at least this high and, or no, it's at least this high. It, it, it doesn't do this. It just appears at the top and it tells you what the number is. So the question is, how did Grok do it? And the answer is, of course, uh, right here. You can see it plainly for yourself. I'm sure it's completely obvious to, to all of us. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Very few people in the world probably truly understand w what happened here. But the one thing that's jumping out at me is that this isn't a, a black box solution. So while neural nets were often criticized as being kind of this black box neural networks, we shove some data in one end and then it spits out answers in the other, but we have no idea how it got to those answers. So it's kind of a scary black box. Well, this discovery is kind of a, a glass box, if you will, because Grok420 came up with a, a formula. We humans can now inspect this. Well, not all of us, but some of us, you know, that know what the heck this is, can inspect it, figure it out, understand why it works. They can write a paper about it, contributing further to our understanding of the subject. So as the professor is saying here, so any significance of this result 
it will not tell you how to change the world tomorrow. Rather, it gives a small step towards understanding what is going on with averages of stochastic analogs of derivatives, quadratic variations of Boolean functions. How small can they be? I think a lot of people will be thrown off by the language. In fact, if you scroll down to the first comment, first comment goes, I don't understand any of the math, but this feels significant. The next comment, whatever you say, bro. The point that he's saying here, so that this whole thing, just pretend it says math we don't yet understand that humans have not yet been able to grasp. So he's saying it, in this case, croc 4.20, gives a small step towards understanding this math that we don't fully understand yet. So what does this mean? This is a credible report. This is a very credible institution, researchers. So this is a credible report that Grok 420 is capable of automated theorem discovery. And if you've been following the stories, Grok 4.20 isn't the first one, but it's very much kind of near the front of the best foundation models in the world that recently have been kind of, you could say, acquiring these abilities. So this is a Terence Tao considered by many to be the most gifted, the number one mathematician in the world. A few days ago, he posted this on, I thought it said Mastodon, it's a Mathstadon, Mathstadon. So he's saying recently the application of AI tools passed a milestone, specifically this is for what they call Erdish problems, a thousand plus problems that are very unique, interesting, challenging. They're sort of hand picked to be well, unique, interesting, challenging, etc. So he's saying recently AI more or less autonomously solved one of these Erdish problems. They did it in the bright manner, like how you're supposed to, in the spirit of the problem, with the result they gave not replicated in existing literature. Since he posted this, there's been multiple other ones that have been solved. So this is Neil Somani. I think the last time I said that he he is a quantitative researcher at Citadel. So I guess it has previously, previously he was. So I apologize for the mix-up. So currently he's doing formal methods and a mechanistic interpretability. So he's in machine learning, AI, AI safety. So over the weekend, he picked up a GPT 5.2 Pro and submitted another sort of solution that's generated by this AI system for one of the Erdish problems, number 397 in particular, and there's a number of other ones. So what this means is that we very, very recently, sometime within the last few months, crossed a very important threshold. So I think it's referred to, or we can use this term, automated theorem and discovery. Right, so this AI discovering theorems on its own. So turns Tao saying that it was more or less autonomously. So there was some feedback from an initial attempt from Professor Ivana Svili. I do believe he's saying that, you know, as he's stating, it sounds like it was autonomous, right? So it's found a new Bellman function. And certainly that's what it seems like it's happening here, right? So they gave it to this, it thought for five minutes, 15 seconds, and then boom. So if this was kind of a before automated theorem and discovery, and this is after, right? So GPT 5.2 is right now making a lot of noise because there's a number of things that seem to indicate that it, it crossed that threshold. And again, this is not like a, a real thing, but what I'm saying is in the past, we didn't have any examples like this. And now we have examples like this. Also, I believe Alpha Evolve from Google DeepMind had something and I saw it announced. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but that is also kind of a a whole system. So it's large language model with scaffolding and tons of other things kind of built around it. So it's like a whole AI system, whereas it sounds like GPT 5.2, just the chatbot is solving these issues. Rock 420 seems like it's just the chatbot by itself that's that's solving these things. And now just, you know, not that long. So, so all this happened over the course of the last few months. Uh, what we're talking about of GPT 5.2, that was the last less than two weeks. And now, boom, we have a Grok. Grok 4.20 just comes charging in. It's not bleary-eyed. It's not sleepy. There's a, a whole different energy. And there's probably a lot of other examples. In fact, Terence Tao has a whole list of different things that AI has been able to accomplish, kind of like what proofs it was able to write or improve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is Hung Yuan Mei. So he's ex-Google DeepMind and now building AGI at XAI. He's saying to understand the universe, we've doubled down on pushing Grok's mathematical reasoning. It's deeply rewarding to see that progress making a real impact, recognized by the math community. 
Also, it looks like the team at XAI is offering early access, sounds like to Grok for 24 scientific discovery. If you want to use it for scientific discovery, sounds like they might get you a pass. Mr. Elon Musk is saying that Neuralink is, isn't required for digital superintelligence because AI is going to get there first without brain implants. The point of Neuralink, that's uh, real values boosting our own bandwidth since our daily output is incredibly limited compared to machines. And certainly if you think about it, we're very great limited, so to speak, based on how we communicate, whether that's through words or sign language or or typing or whatever. We, we tend to think a lot faster than we can communicate those thoughts. It would be great to be able to kind of communicate with AI at the speed of thought. Sometimes I write something into Gemini or ChatGPT or, or Grok and like it has a ton of spelling errors, right? Some of the words don't look right. And just like the thought is kind of barely completed because I had a thought and just kind of mashed the keyboard and I hit enter. And most of the time nowadays they, they get it. Like if you showed me a week later what I wrote, I would not be able to understand what I wrote. But these AI models, they're like, oh yeah, that's crystal clear. I know exactly what you mean. Let me explain it for you. In other news, it looks like Elon's case against open AI is going to trial. Charles Xi is taking bets on who's going to win. So it looks like it opened at under a 30% chance that Elon's going to win, quickly went to 31, then 36. Now it's up to 41%. Elon Musk retweets it saying, I've lost a few battles over the years, but I've never lost a war. It looks like since then, the thing went up to 60%. So people are betting that Elon is going to win his case against OpenAI. Potentially, if I understand correctly, is it possible that they're going to reverse their ability to, to go to a for-profit model? This would mean that they would not have the ability to do their IPO, to go public on the stock market. The thing is, Elon Musk did bankroll OpenAI before they had a lot of the funding. He was like one of the first money in, I believe. But since it was a non-profit, then that means that was kind of like a donation, right? With no strings attached. But if now OpenAI grows to whatever size it is now, it looks like $750 billion, right? I wonder if it's possible that Elon Musk is going to get a stake in the company as they go IPO. Would that be entertaining? Are you not entertained? Because if it is entertaining, then it's the most likely outcome. I believe that's referred to as the Musk's razor. I'm not even kidding. That's an actual thing. Musk's razor, right? It's saying that the most ironic or entertaining outcome is often the most probable. If you recall, there was some time a while back where Elon did get emotional during the interview describing how difficult it was to hear his heroes, the people that he kind of looked up to, criticizing him and what he's doing with SpaceX, etc. Interestingly, this email exchange surfaced somewhere. So Sam Altman emailing Elon Musk saying, I remember seeing you in a TV interview a long time ago, maybe 60 minutes. Were you being attacked by some guys and they were heroes of yours and it was really tough? Well, you're my hero and that's what it feels like when you attack OpenAI. I totally get we have screwed some stuff up, but we have worked incredibly hard to do the right thing. And I think we have ensured that neither Google nor anyone else is on a path to have unilateral control over AGI, which I believe we both think is critical. I am tremendously thankful for everything you've done to help. I don't think OpenAI would have happened without you. And it really freaking hurts when you publicly attack OpenAI. So Elon replies saying, I hear you. And it's certainly not my intention to be hurtful for which I apologize, but the fate of civilization is at stake. So definitely our sort of progress towards AGI is one of the areas where I would feel a lot safer. I would definitely prefer it if there was no, no strife no drama, as the kids put it. But it does look like a lot of these interests, they're on a collision course, and um, it's, it's going to get wild. Let me know in the comments where you think this will end. Do you think Elon will ripple open AI, prevent them from getting IPO'd, from, from getting funding? Or do you think this lawsuit will fall flat? Or do you think it's possible he's going to get a stake in open AI or get some control over open AI? Let me know what you think and what, what you wish would happen. And finally, we have this. So I remember seeing some posts about this December 22nd, 2025. So XAI is having a partnership with the Department of War. So here in the States, if you're not familiar, we're, we're figuring out what we want to call this thing. It used to be called the War Department back before 1947. Then we renamed it the Department of Defense. 
And now we're back to the Department of War. So this is yet another thing that maybe possibly could be seen as a rivalry. So if you recall that Project Stargate that was announced, it was half a trillion dollars, it was $500 billion, a joint venture between OpenAI, SoftBank, and Oracle. And that was to build out the infrastructure. For Musk publicly kind of bashed Stargate saying they don't have the funding and it's not going to go anywhere. Meanwhile, it looks like XAI and Elon Musk, they're locking down the kind of the national security apparatus, potentially the most stable customer on the planet. The interesting thing is, as you might know, in the US, a lot of these different departments in the government, they all kind of have their little data silos that they kind of keep hidden from everybody else. There's some opaqueness. There's not a lot of transparency there. It seems like there's some political will now to reverse that. So there's some decrees to break down that data siloing. So it's very possible that a foundation model, if you have access to that data for, for training, for fine tuning purposes, that could certainly be a gold mine. And finally, we have a new Grok model being tested in the LM arena. It's called Slate Flow. Apparently, there's also another one called Tide Wisp. Now, those are, of course, rumors that take it with a great grain of salt. But, you know, I mean, they tend to be pretty accurate when we see something on LM Arena. Oftentimes, it does translate into the release of those models, you know, usually several weeks later. We don't always get it right which model is. Sometimes we think it's going to be one model. It's, you know, by OpenAI, but it's like some other different model that people didn't expect. So I tested that. It looks like I was able to get a slate flow. It returned Python code that worked very decent, very fast. I'm going to try to test it with some more difficult prompts because this wasn't, uh, wasn't testing it to its full sort of capabilities. But whatever the case is, it looks like Elon Musk is gearing up for war you know, figuratively, but but also kind of literally working with the Department of War. He's talked in the past about his concerns because in a lot of a critical military infrastructure that we need, namely drones, we are heavily reliant on Chinese technology. Or I should say U.S. is relying on Chinese technology. There's not that much of a manufacturing capability here for drones compared to, you know, DGI owns most of the market. So it's estimated that that one drone company owns a 70 to over 90% in consumer and commercial sectors. And of course, when you're interacting with Grok, you do notice that it's kind of built differently than a lot of the other models. There's less social filters. There's situations with the other models where it seems like they're not sure which sort of a political side to take. Grok has always presented itself kind of a cemented status as this kind of like no nonsense, unhinged, follow the truth. And so one of the key reasons that the administration cited using Grok, or the, the reason they gave why they wanted to use Grok, is because it has a lack of what they called ideological constraints. So they want something that will adhere to lawful military action rather than social safety filters. Which, to be fair, some of these filters can be problematic with a lot of these models because they'll refuse to answer some fairly basic questions that, because they see some ethical conflict there that doesn't really exist. So it'd be kind of interesting to see how far advanced Elon thought this through. Was this in some part positioned to be able to, to be put in this particular situation where it now interacts with all the employees for the Department of War, potentially making some decisions on the battlefield, or if not decisions, then at least kind of like simulating through all the possible outcomes and presenting the decision makers of kind of here's what the chances of this conflict going in these particular ways. And then the generals or whoever's making the decisions will be able to kind of take those reports and make their human decisions based on those reports. All right, so that's it for me. I feel like the next few weeks are going to be huge. It seems like just news are dropping every single day. So stay frosty, as they say. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you in the next one.